that's another old revision of uh, of uh, what what dynamic equilibrium was all about so so we're going to start with with dynamic equilibrium and we're going to first learn what happened in dynamic equilibrium uh, dynamic equilibrium was by definition you go you're going to be asked this definition it's it's uh, it's when it's it is when the rate of forward reaction equals the rate of it equals the rate of backward reaction in a reversible reaction and we can also write in a closed system equilibriums are always achieved in closed systems like if you uh, in which particles are not escaping or not leaving or entering the container so in a closed system So that is what uh, what dynamic equilibrium is, uh, and remember the focus is on the word uh, that the rate of forward reaction it's going to equal the rate of it equals the rate of the backward reaction. That is what equilibrium is. So it's a it's the comment is about rate. It's not about the concentrations of the reactants or the concentration of the product nothing to do with concentration nothing it's always the rate so when you have a reaction going on as a, so what's going to happen is when you have a reaction going on uh, and there is h2 and i2 reacting and equilibrium or reversible reactions are always represented by this double arrow and they have uh, they're forming two hi so the rate of forward reaction like the speed with which the products are being formed and the speed with which uh, the reactants or the or the product is decomposing that speed is going to be equal so that is what uh, what equilibrium is so uh, if i want to explain this uh, which you pro probably already know most of it so if i have a container and it's got uh, remember reactions are not always at equilibrium they always achieve equilibrium so if I have H2, so I've got a bunch of H2 molecules. And so I've got H2 and I've got a bunch of uh, I2 molecules. Let's say the green ones are I2 molecules. And, and I've added H2 and I2 in a container what would happen is that initially it's not going to be at equilibrium because initially only the forward reaction is going to take place uh, because there is no hi so hi will not decompose because there is no hi to begin with so what would happen is that an h2 molecule so an h2 molecule and an i2 molecule will react together and they would end up forming uh, two hi molecules so the HI molecules have this color, let's say, let's say they are black in color. So they're going to end up reacting and they're, they're going to form two HI molecules. And the process keeps on repeating. An H2 molecule and an I2 molecule, they react and they produce two HI molecules. Uh, similarly, H2 and I2 molecule, they react and they produce two HI molecules. So the reaction starts happening and you get more and more HI molecules getting produced. And eventually when you have enough HI molecules, a reverse reaction would also start. So the H2, the two HI molecules, I mean this H, HI molecule and this HI molecule over here, they might meet together and they would end up forming H2 and I2. I2 was probably the green one and they're going to form H2 and I2 back again. So it's going, it's, it's a back and forth reaction. It's, it's happening. The forward products are being formed and the reactants are being formed as well. Now, so the equilibrium is that the speed with which the, uh, the products are being formed and the speed with which the reactants are being formed again, that's equal. When that is equal, the concentration of the reactants would become constant. 
and the products as well. It becomes constant, sorry, not equal. Equal is a wrong word. It becomes constant. Not equal. The concentration could be anything. Like you could have more products. You can have more reactants at equilibrium. Uh, the equilibrium could favor the products. So that means that the more products being formed at equilibrium. The, uh, the equilibrium could have more reactants at equilibrium. Uh, or it could be right in the middle. There could be the same amount of reactants and the same amount of products. So the concentration could vary. Every reactant and every product can have a different concentration, except that if it's at equilibrium, the concentration, it would become constant. It's not going to change. Uh, why? Because uh, the rate at which eta is being formed, like if 10 molecules are formed every second and 10 molecules decompose every second, then the amount of eta remains exactly the same as it was before. So is that clear? Yes. As a similarly, you can um, you can be uh, there would be graphs that you would have to deal with. Uh, let me just. As a, so they're going to be graphs uh, that they're going to ask you about. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to make a graph for the same. So if I plot the graph of H2 in I2 and it's at equilibrium with 2HI and it has already reached, I mean, I'm going to show you how it's going to reach equilibrium. And let's say it equilibrium favors the reactants. I mean, the container I showed you, it favors the reactants. What, what that means is that there are more reactants at equilibrium. So uh, my container initially had H2 and I2. Those were my reactants. Or I'm just going to I'm just going to write uh, R over here to get the concentration of my reactants. And this axis is time. So the concentration of my reactants, like the one, the diagram that I just made, the reactants would start reacting with each other. The H2 and I2s are going to react with each other. And they're going to start forming HI. So the amount of H2 and I2 would start to, it would start to decrease, but it would eventually become constant. Uh, why? Because equilibrium is reached. So uh, at equilibrium, you've got more H2 and I2. I mean, the amount does not decrease that much and equilibrium reaches. The products initially had zero concentration, like there was no product at all. The products started forming and eventually their amount also became constant. So is this graph clear? Yes. I said now, by looking at the graph, what's the point when equilibrium was reached? The equilibrium was reached at this point when the concentration of the reactants and the products becomes constant, that indicates that this is the time at which, wait a second. So this is the point at which equilibrium was reached. At this particular point. So is this also clear that that's the point when equilibrium was reached? Or you could have another graph and that graph would be where H2 and I2 are, f the equilibrium is favoring the products. So what would that graph look like? Uh, so remember the concentration of the reactants and products could vary completely. Just one second. So here's another graph, which I'm going to draw. I'm going to rub these off. As so this time, the equilibrium is favoring the products, which means that they're going to be a lot more products formed than the equilibrium is reached. The line becomes constant. And 
the reactants would be a lot less. You started off with a lot of reactants, but the reactants got used up and eventually the line became constant. So now you've at equilibrium, this is the point when probably equilibrium was reached when it became constant. So that's your equilibrium point. This axis represents time. So equilibrium has been reached. Uh, I'm talking about the same reaction, H2 and I2 in equilibrium with 2HI. So your equilibrium is this time favoring the reactants. So the reason I'm discussing these graph questions is because uh, a lot of the data has, I mean, I mean, recently a few questions have come where they had to, where you had to extract data from the graphs. Now, when you have to extract data from the from the graphs and they're talking about equilibrium, so remember this is the point when equilibrium has been reached. So if you want to know the concentration of the reactants and the products at equilibrium, you're going to you're not going to look at these concentrations. This is the point where equilibrium has not been reached. The products are continuously increasing. Uh, that means the rate of forward reaction and the rate of backward reaction is not equal. The products are constantly increasing. The reactants are constantly getting used up. This is the point. This is where you're going to take the values from. Is this point clear? Yes. Yes. Do you get any questions about this? Do you get, is this clear? So just be very careful that if you have to extract data about uh, equilibrium from a graph, uh, remember one thing is the concentrations can all vary. The reactants, all the reactants can have different concentrations. All the products can have different concentrations, but at equilibrium when the rate of forward reaction and backward reaction is equal, the concentrations can all be different, but they're not going to change. They're going to be constant. Like if this product has a concentration of this, it would remain this with respect to time. Uh, the reactant would have a fixed concentration. It's not going to change. Uh, so that's how your graphs look like. Uh, this is what the graph would look like if it's favoring the reactants. This is what the graph would look like if it's favoring the products. As anyways, moving on. Uh, another, sorry. So moving on, another very important point. Uh, let me extend this line first. So now another important point about this is whenever you talk about equilibrium, you're not actually be very careful. Whenever you talk about equilibrium, uh, a comment on equilibrium is not a comment on rate. Okay, let's let's discuss this later after Lee Shatler principle. Let's talk about Lee Shatler principle first. So what's the Lee Shatler principle in a single line? TK, you guys already know this. Now Lee Shatler principle is when the rate uh, that the equilibrium opposes any change that's introduced to the system. to the system. Now the changes can happen in a couple of ways. Uh, I mean, the three ways. Uh, one is temperature. The other one is obviously pressure and you've got, you've got concentration. You can change the concentration as well. So, so there could be three changes that can be introduced to the system and the equilibrium is going to be affected. Uh, so the equilibrium position would change. It would either move towards the products or it would move towards the reactants. Uh, you can have more forward reaction, you could have more backward reaction. So the first one is, let's talk about temperature. Can you tell me what's the what happens when you increase temperature? Which reaction is favored? Forward. Needs. If you increase temperature, because we don't know, is it going to be endothermic or exothermic? Exo. 
they remember when you increase temperature it's always going to be the endothermic reaction that's favored and i'm going to use the word favored here I said, so it's, it's, remember this, it's always, I'm, I'm going to do an example as well. If you decrease temperature, it's always the exothermic reaction that's going to, uh, going to be favored. So that's the rule for temperature. And I'm going to explain why this is the rule. Uh, for example, if I have a container and that container has uh, water in it, so there's H2O liquid. Now this container is by default, it's at, uh, I mean, like if you have a closed water bottle, nothing seems to evaporate. Like the liquid water in a closed water bottle, if it's an open water bottle, if it's an open system, it's going to evaporate, but not in a closed system. Why? Because um, there is constant evaporation happening. Water molecules are constantly changing into water vapors. But the thing is they don't have any place to go. So they just bump around, they just collide with the walls of the container, eventually they lose energy and they condense back. So what's happening is it's a reversible reaction. It's a reversible reaction where liquid water is changing into, into H2O gas. And remember the enthalpy change is always given for, for the forward reaction. Can anyone tell me what's the, uh, what's the enthalpy change for this reaction? Is it liquid water into gas? Is it endothermic or exothermic? Endo. Okay, yeah, that's endo. Uh, so that's positive. Uh, that is positive and uh, it's endothermic. Uh, so remember, enthalpy change is always given th for the forward reaction. The forward reaction is the one that's endo. The backward reaction is going to be exactly the opposite and that applies to all reactions. I mean, every time it's going to be different. Like it depends on the, it depends on this uh, enthalpy change. What it all depends on, on this thing. Uh, so it pretty much all depends on this. That it could be positive, it could be negative. But the enthalpy change, which we, we just did energetics and we did discuss that uh, you could have all sorts of reactions. There could be exothermic reactions, there could be endothermic reactions. So remember, we, uh, you have to be careful what is the forward reaction. By looking at the enthalpy change, it's going to be endothermic. The backward is going to be the opposite. It's going to be exothermic. So first thing, you have to identify, uh, and for different reactions, it's going to be different. So for every reaction, you have to identify which one is the endo and which one is the exo. The next step is, I said, let's explain. I, I just told you that if you increase temperature, the endothermic reaction is going to be favored. So if I increase temperature by just uh, look at the reaction, uh, common sense says one of the reaction is evaporation. So if I increase temperature, then at higher temperatures, obviously there's going to be more evaporation. So, so if you increase temperature, there's going to be more evaporation, right? if I start boiling it, if I start to increase temperature, there's going to be more evaporation. And evaporation is the endothermic reaction. That's very obvious because uh, when you increase temperature, the reaction that requires energy, that would automatically speed up because it obviously needs energy and you're giving it energy. So, so at a higher temperature, endothermic reactions are favored. There's going to be more water vapors formed. So a lot more water vapors would be formed if you start heating the container and vice versa if you decrease temperature like if i put this uh, container in a f in in a refrigerator it's if i decrease temperature then automatically there's going to be more condensation that's going to happen and condensation is the process where molecules lose energy so that is an exothermic reaction tk is this clear and you can apply this to any reaction. So is this clear? Yes. So you can apply this to any reaction. Uh, let's say I have this reaction, N2 plus H2. Now quickly tell me, let's practice a few examples. Uh, N2 plus 3H2 and it's in equilibrium with 2NH3. 
and the delta H for this reaction is given as uh, as minus 88 kilojoules per mole. So what I'm doing is I'm I'm decreasing temperature. Which reaction would be favored? In this Exothermic, case, exothermic, which is the back, the forward. Exactly. So we know uh, from the from the rule, we know that if you decrease temperature, the rule is written over here. If you de if you decrease temperature, it's always the exothermic reaction that's going to be favored. So we know that it's going to be the exothermic reaction. The next step would be to identify which one is the exothermic. So we know that the exothermic reaction would be favored. And since the forward reaction is given as minus 88, uh, the forward reaction, I mean, the enthalpy change is always for the forward reaction. That means that the forward is the one that's exo. So that means the forward reaction is going to be favored. Is this clear? Yes. Yes. And then also note just a minor point uh, that, I mean, you can get tricky questions on this. Uh, remember this, uh, that if a reaction is exothermic, temperature increases. Uh, but let's ignore that. So that's the first point. Let's focus on this point. That's our first point. I'll just highlight that. Uh, So that's point number one. TK, remember that, memorize that. Next one, let's talk about pressure. Um, now remember the pressure is, uh, the only thing that's going to be affected by pressure is our gases. So this is only for gases. And the rule is that if you increase pressure, then the side which has less gas moles would be favored or the side that has less gas, that's going to be favored. And vice versa, if you, if you decrease pressure, then more gas mole side would be I mean, in simple words, it's basically if you decrease pressure, if you increase pressure, uh, less gas would be formed. And if you decrease pressure, more gas would be formed. I mean, that's our rule. And let's, let's uh, do a quick explanation and be, uh, be very careful. It's only for gases. Reactions that don't have gases, nothing would happen. As I said, I'm, I'm going to do an example for this. Uh, let's say I have a beaker now. And this time my beaker has a piston that's attached on top of it. So there is a movable, there's a movable piston. And we can sort of, one second. So we have Just one second. Just hold on one second. As so I have, I have a movable piston because I've made my piston. And it now has water liquid. And the water is constantly evaporating. It has turned into steam, water vapors. So there's H2O gas. So I have this, I have this, and there's an equilibrium. Like there's evaporation and condensation both happening. Now, if I increase pressure, what does that mean? Where should I, in which direction should I push the piston? Downwards or upwards? Downwards. Okay, so it's going to be downwards, right? So I'm going to push the piston downwards. So it's going to move downwards. And when I do that, uh, the volume decreases. So 
So would I get more water vapors or would I get less water vapors? Like this piston is moving downwards now, right? So the amount of water vapors would be lesser because if I, there would be less and less water vapors, there's going to be more condensation happening because you're running out of space. You can't have a lot of water vapors now. There's going to be more condensation that would start happening as you start moving the piston downwards, so start pushing it down. Is that clear? Yes. Yes. So the point is that if you have this equilibrium going on and you've got water in gaseous state, right? Now over here, there is no moles of gas. There's zero moles of gas. Over here, there's one mole of gas. So if the reaction moves forward, there's going to be more gas. If the reaction moves backwards, there's going to be less gas. So if I increase pressure, less gas mole side is favored. Uh, less gas mole side is the backward reaction. It's that's the one that's going to be, that's the one that's going to be favored, this one. Uh, less gas would be produced uh, because all the gas would change into liquid water. Is that clear? Yes. And the other yes. one, and the other is the opposite. Like if you, if you decrease pressure, you're pulling the piston upwards, right? So when you do that, uh, pressure decreases, but as it happens, the volume increases. So now a lot more evaporation can happen. You can have more and more water vapors that could be produced because you have no, you have more room now. So when you increase pressure, so vice versa, when you decrease pressure, you automatically have more volume. So there's a lot more volume now. So more gas is going to be produced. So remember pressure has no effect on liquids and gases, sorry, liquids and solids because they're incompressible and they don't expand. It's only gases. Uh, so pressure only matters if there are gas molecules present in the equilibrium. So I'm going to do a simple example. Let's do an example. Do you just remember increased pressure, less gas. Decreased pressure, you're going to get more gas. So you've got this reaction N2 plus 3H2. And that's again in equilibrium with 2NH3. Now forget endothermic and exothermic. That doesn't really matter now. What would happen if I decrease pressure? Which side will the equilibrium shift? Backwards or forwards? Forwards. First thing, if you decrease pressure, which what what would happen? More gas or less gas? More gas. Okay, so you're going to get more gas. More gas mole side is favored. So which side has more gas? I mean, this side has like if the reaction goes in the backward direction, it's going to produce four moles of gas. If the reaction goes in the forward direction, it's going to produce uh, it's going to produce just two moles of gas. So that means the reaction would shift. There's going to be more backward reaction. More gas would be produced. So hence, backward reaction is favored. Is this clear? Yes. Yeah. So you're going to get more backward reaction. Um, similarly, like if you do, let's do another example. Uh, like if you have uh, like your carbonated drinks, uh, they've got, I say your carbonated drinks have, uh, have this reaction going on. It's H2CO3. I mean, it's, it's basically acid. And the water and carbon dioxide, they combine to form H2CO3, right? So there's this reaction going on back and forth. Now, uh, simultaneously at the same time. Now, if I, this one is obviously a liquid and CO2 is a gas. So when I open a bottle of, let's say, Coke and I open it, what I'm basically doing is I'm decreasing pressure, right? So if you decrease pressure, what would happen? More gas, more side would be favored. Which in this case is which side, forward or backward? Forward. 
forward theek hai because in the forward side you've got exactly one mole of gas and in your reverse reaction you you don't have any gas that's just aqueous so there's zero moles of gas so because more gas moles are going to be more gas mole side is going to be favored it's going to, it's going to favor the forward reaction which is why you start seeing bubbles forming because all the carbon dioxide it starts to escape it starts to form because now you have all of a sudden when you open the bottle cap there's a lot more space now so more gas mole side is favored which in this case would be the would be the forward reaction is this clear yes yes i said then you have uh, the last one this is about gases be very careful only for gases it only applies this pressure thing only applies to gases like the reaction like if a reaction doesn't have gases then it doesn't really matter uh, i mean increasing or decreasing pressure will have absolutely no effect i said let's also talk about concentration now what's going to happen uh, when you alter concentration so the rule for concentration is that if you increase or decrease concentration of anything whether it's your reactant whether it's your product as a concentration of any substance as that's part of the equilibrium then equilibrium tries to do the opposite or it favors that reaction that does exactly the opposite so if i try to increase something it's going to try and decrease something the same thing if i try to decrease something then it's going to try and increase the same thing so an example would be uh let's take the same example the same water container example i said so here's my uh forget the piston tk we don't need the piston now i'm not changing pressure so the point is that over here you can see there's liquid water and there's steam right so there's an equilibrium that's happening between them now all of a sudden the rule is that if i remove all the water vapors i go in and i have some absorbent material and it absorbs all the all the water vapors so all the water vapors are gone so there were two reactions happening and now we don't have any water vapors the like h2o gas there is no h2o gas right i mean previously the reaction was going in forward and backward reaction right so i've i've removed h2o gas i said now out of the two which reaction will stop immediately like h2o gas is gone right so you can't have this backward reaction like condensation cannot happen is this clear yes theek okay, hai so there is no condensation because all the h2o gas is gone i've removed it but can evaporation still happen i mean it can there's nothing stopping evaporation from happening because you still have liquid water and it can still evaporate right so what would eventually happen is that evaporation would continue and water vapors would eventually form back again and when they form then obviously they would start condensing back again and the equilibrium would be reformed so what's basically happening is i removed water vapors what it did was that it created more water vapors that's it it, it did exactly the opposite so equilibrium automatically increased water vapors so if i try to uh, remove them again and the backward reaction stops but the forward reaction is still going on evaporation can still happen and more water vapors would be formed back again 
So whatever I do, it's going to do the opposite. If I try to add more water vapors, if I try to add extra water vapors, like from outside, I add excess steam, then there's going to be a lot more condensation that's going to happen. So it's going to favor that reaction that's going to do the opposite. So if I try to increase water vapors, there's going to be a lot more condensation that would happen and the amount of water vapors would automatically start to decrease. Is this clear? Yes. Yeah. So we can do an example. Uh, let's say I have this reaction. I've got uh, N2 and O2 reacting in equilibrium and they're forming 2NO, right? So can anyone tell me what would happen if I, if I decrease O2? And remember, focus on the word concentration. That's very important because what we mean by what we what we are talking about. Sorry, what's this? Just one second. I said, so what? So focus on the word concentration. We're talking about concentration here. Now, if I decrease O2 concentration, which reaction would be favored, forward or backward? Backward you get backward if i decrease o2 it's going to try and make more o2 the equilibrium would do the opposite backward reaction would be favored and equilibrium tries to increase concentration of o2 So is this clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I said, so we uh, did all the, and let me highlight this one as well. So we did all of the rules of uh, Lee Shattle principle. Uh, just one second. So we did all of the rules of uh, Lee Shatler principle, which was uh, uh, temperature increase or decrease temperature, pressure increase or decrease pressure, and concentration. So just a, well, just one thing is missing. Uh, the word concentration it only applies to it's only suitable for solutions. Like things in solutions have concentrations. Like you can have a very high salt concentration or a very dilute solution. So, so it's only for solution or for gases. What is concentration? Concentration is number of particles per unit volume. It's, it's moles over volume. Like how many particles do you have per unit volume? So, so concentration is the term that's only used for gases or solutions. And also remember for, uh, uh, for solids, concentration is constant, it's one. It never changes. Uh, because the amount of particles per unit volume, it's always constant because they're all tightly packed. So uh, for solids, the concentration never changes. Uh, water in aqueous solutions. Or anything that's in excess. So I'm going to explain that later. Anything in excess. has constant concentration. It never changes. So for solids, hopefully it's obviously clear that in solids, the particles are all tightly packed. So the amount of particles per unit volume is always constant. Uh, so it never changes, whether the solid is powdered or you have a large piece of rock or a small piece of rock. The term concentration doesn't really apply to it. Uh, water in aqueous solution or anything in, in excess. What that means is, like if I have two reactants, X plus Y, there are two molecules of X in a particular volume and there are uh, 10,000 molecules of Y and they react in 1-1 one -one ratio. So if 50% of X reacts, so how many are you left with? You're just left with one, right? Because one of them reacted. Uh, so f what amount of Y would react? One would react with one. So Y amount of Y would be 9,999. So what happens is that the concentration of X has decreased by half. 
but if something is in excess, it's in large excess, then there's hardly any noticeable change in Y. The amount of Y is kind of constant. Is this idea clear? Yes. Yes. Okay, so if you have a beaker and you've added two things and they're reacting together, but one of them is in excess, that means in large excess. Specifically, we should use the word large excess. Like you added too much of it, then it then then its concentration would always be constant. Like if uh, if you have one billion molecules and ten molecules react out of the billion, the amount is still pretty much constant. It, there's hardly any change in the amount of that substance. So anything that's in large excess, specifically in aqueous solutions, if there's water involved, uh, in aqueous solutions, aqueous solutions are mostly water. So so there's too much water in it. So the amount, if there, if there are a few molecules of water being produced or being consumed, the amount of water concentration kind of remains constant. It doesn't really change. TK, so is this point clear? Yes. Yes. So yeah. let's uh, continue with the same thing. We'll do questions on the Shatler principle in the next class then. TK, let's do continue tomorrow then. Yeah, okay, take care. Tik Abdullah, just one second. Sending it in the group. Thank you, sir. Allah Hafiz. Okay, take care. Allah Hafiz.